An applause for Bodil Stocker, please. With Rust data structures at ease, though her Twitter explains she is asking for brains, she will only fill them with IDs. Good morning. I'm sort of awake, how about you? Uh, it's just me or is the sound good now? Oh, excellent. Okay, hi. I'm Bodil, and I've been writing this uh, library for immutable data structures in Rust called uh, immutable.rs is, is the domain name. It's just im on cargo, on crates.io. Um, and I'd like to basically run you through them. Um, I expected this talk to be, to have a lot of code and, and a lot of fancy examples and live coding. and. I wrote it, and it turns out it's mostly diagrams about how amazing data structures are. So prepare for some graph theory, I guess. Um, first of all, this is Don. Don is going to be your background for today. <laughs> uh, Don is a um, relatively famous computer scientist, and this is one of his most exciting, his most favorite subjects. So he's very excited for you to learn about data structures today. It's going to be there in the background all the time, cheering you on. Um, if I get too complicated, you should absolutely feel free to interrupt me and, and ask me to clarify. Um, so let's get started. Uh, what is a data structure? Let's, let's start with the, like, the fundamental definitions here. Um, anybody care to offer an opinion? No, I still in, in, in the morning for that. I'm just going to give you the, the thing I got when I asked Google, what is a data structure? A way of organizing data so that it can be accessed and modified efficiently, which is just sort of a, a fancy generic way of saying a list, or a map, or a key value store, or a key store without the values, which will be a set, and, and various other things that you don't see quite as much in, in standard libraries, like uh, graphs and matrices and that sort of thing. Uh, and that's that word immutable that I, I was using in the title of this talk. So we need to know about mutable versus immutable. And this is the idea that something that is mutable, that means it's changeable, essentially. Uh, a good example of, of a mutable data structure or a mutable value is a VEC. Whereas an immutable value would be something like a number, because you can't really change a number. I mean, if you've got a variable with a number in it, you can change what number is in the variable. But you can't take the number four and make it be the number five from now on, for instance. But with a vec, if you change the vec, the, it's something else now, essentially. If you add uh, something to the end of it, then uh, the vec has kind of a new value inside it. That makes it mutable. And then there's persistent data structures. That's sort of the, the technical term for something that isn't mutable. And it's exa exactly that, a data structure that persists its current state when changed, which basically means if you change it, you don't really change it. You just get a, a new value back. It's like 2 plus 2. You don't change the number 2 by adding 2 to it. You get the, no the number 4 back. So uh, we also need to talk about complexity. We need to have um, some sort of a vocabulary for being able to, to talk about uh, the efficiency of operations on, uh, on data structures, like, say, adding an element to the back of a list. So I'm going to introduce you to big O notation. But I'm going to keep it to the basics. Don't worry too much. Uh, I, I'm only going to talk about the pieces of big O notation that you tend to see most in, when talking about data structures. And the simplest one by far is what we would call constant time operations. We write that as, as O1. So the, the big O notation comes from the big O in front of the parentheses here. And uh, sort of the, um, what kind of big O notation we're talking about is, is what is inside the parentheses. And this means that um, for a given operation, if it runs in constant time, you need the same amount of, of, of operations to perform it as uh, regardless of um, 
how large the data structure is. Whereas with linear time, that's basically walking through the entire data structure element by element. Um, it's proportional to the, the size of the data structure or the length of the, the list or whatever you, you like to call it. Then there's logarithmic time. That's O log n. That's where the number of operations you have to perform is logarithmic to the size of the data structure. And this is what you would see if you say, if you're walking down a single branch of a tree. It's, uh, it's not as good as linear time. Uh, sorry, it's not as good as constant time, but it's a lot better than linear time by far, usually. Um, so basically, these are the three we need to pay attention to, and they're ordered by how good they are, or rather how fast they are. Um, constant time is best. Logarithmic time is still pretty good. Linear time is not great. We tend to, to want to not have to use operations that require linear time. There's also, you might see this one, linear times logarithmic time, O n log n. Uh, this is, it should be the worst case performance for something like a sort operation. Um, some sort operations run to, to polynomial time, uh, O n squared. But if you see that, you're using a very bad sorting algorithm. Um, the best ones would be, will perform in linear time, in, in the very best case, and in n log n time. But we're not going to be seeing any n log n today. There's also this idea of amortization, which means basically that uh, the cost of an operation can be spread out over several operations. And, and I'm going to illustrate this by example. This is an array. It's about the simplest data structure you can think of. It's just basically a chunk of memory uh, that you've allocated, and you've put um, your elements in sequence inside it. Um, in Rust, you might have used the VEC data structure. It's about the most basic data structure in Rust. Uh, the VEC is kind of like an array, except it's got the added optimization that uh, if you look at the array, what will be the cost of adding something at the end? Oh, and somebody said that's quite correct. Because what you have to do in this case, because it, it's completely, um, it's allocated to the extent of it, is you basically have to allocate a new section of memory, copy this, and then add your element at the end. That's linear time. So the VEC has this optimization where it pre-allocates some memory that it thinks you're probably going to use. And then it keeps track of the actual size of your, of your, your vector and the, the capacity of it. So what will be the cost of adding an element at the back of this vector? Constant time, linear. Uh, no, constant time, O1. Um, if you do that four times, however, you run out of space. And the cost at that point, that would be linear time, that would be ON. So basically what we've done here is, is we've amortized the cost of, of pushing to the end of it by pre-allocating some memory so that for most operations like this, it's going to be a constant time, but sometimes, it's going to be a lot more expensive, and that's amortization. Now, I'm going to introduce you to your first uh, persistent data structure. This is a note classic. Uh, this was invented back in the 50s, along with uh, a language you might have heard of called, called Lisp. Uh, what you're seeing here is a cons cell. It's basically just a chunk of memory that contains uh, two values, like an array of, of size two but it's structured so that uh, the left-hand side, the, the first element, contains a value, and the right-hand side contains a pointer to another cons cell, or possibly um, an, an empty value, which means uh, there is no more to this list. There are no further elements. And so you can use this to construct basically what is a very unbalanced uh, binary tree, but it also happens to be a list. So that in this case, we've got a list with two elements, Mike and Robert. And so you see the first console contains the value of Mike, and it points to the next console, which is kind of another list on its own, which contains the value of Robert and an empty pointer, which means we're done with the list. 
And so the clever bit here is that appending to the front of the list is actually a constant time operation. It's blindingly fast. Because what you do is basically you, you create a new list with uh, the value that you want to put up front and a pointer to this list. It's called consing, and it looks like this. So now we've got Joe um, in front of Mike and Robert uh, in the list by, by consing him to the front of it. And you notice that if you disregard Joe's constal, this uh, is still just the list with Mike and Robert in it. We haven't changed anything uh, inside the Mike and Robert list. We've just sort of created a new list which contains Joe and then the Mike and Robert list. So that goes Joe, Mike and Robert now. But we are sharing structure with the Mike and Robert list. You could have captured reference to the Mike and Robert list as well. And now you've got two lists, Joe, Mike and Robert, and Mike and Robert. And they are sharing most of their structure, most of their memory. And it was also really fast adding to the front. So Becky can't do that. Um, OK, this is my favorite part. Um, so for historical reasons, um, the console, the names of, of the two elements inside the console are called the car and the cutter. This um, might not seem too obvious to you, um, but it comes from back in the day on the IBM 704 mainframe on which Lisp was originally implemented. Well, these, um, these are actually abbreviations. They mean contents of address register and contents of decrement register. So now it makes sense, yes? <laughs> so yeah, um, this machine had five registers in total. Uh, I guess one of them was the address register, and, and I think it had three decrement registers, which were sort of offsets into that, but they were just using, it, using them to hold like, the, current, the value of the current console that you were looking at. So, so these names stuck. And they're a bit confusing, to be fair. But I love them because they actually compose. This is the thing that, that they did back in, back, in, um, back in the day when Lisp was a big deal. Um, so you had the CADA, which is the car of the CADA. So the car, basically how this works now is the car is the first element of the list, and the cudder is the rest of the list, as you remember. So the car of the cudder would be the second element. You take the cudder first, and then you get the car of that, and that is the second element of the list. Like, that would be Mike. And then you have the cudder, <laughs> the car of the cudder of the cudder, the third element. And the kadada, the kadada of the kadada, which is uh, everything but the first and second elements of the list. And I may have made this up, but the car is the car of the car, which is the first element of the first element, assuming the first element is another list. <sighs> they had fun back in the day. <laughs> but in, in more sensible languages nowadays, we just call them the head and the tail. Bonus point, incidentally, can you name this Pokemon? Dratini. Dratini, you are very good. I'm so impressed. How about this one? <laughs> Sudowoodoo, very good. This is actually a, a second generation Pokemon. I had to look it up. I'm, I'm Pokemon champion of, of the original game, but not the others. I'm, I'm too old for that. Anyway, let's talk about trees. <laughs> so. This, this is a lookup tree. This is a binary tree that we use uh, to look up um, values in an ordered sequence. Um, numbers have ordering. We agree on this, I hope. Uh, so if we're going to look up the element 3 in, in a list that looks like this, how would we go about it? We have a pointer to the, to the top of, of, of the tree. That's all we got. And we know that we're looking up the number 3. And we know that the keys are ordered. So we start at the 4 is 3 larger than 4 or is it smaller than 4? It's smaller, so we go to the left. We find the 2. Is 3 larger than 2 or smaller than 2? It's larger, so we go to the right. And we find the 3, and 3 happens to be equal to 3, so we found our node. So 3 is indeed in this set. 
Um, that's the lookup operation. And this is uh, where it gets clever, because we also want to be able to update this. Suppose that um, this is a map, not just a set. Suppose there's a value stored in the, in the three node, as, along with the, the key three. So we want to be able to update this, but we want to be able to have the same effect as, as with the const list. We want to, um, well, we want it to be a persistent data structure, and we want that structural sharing thing. So what we do then is we are going to start to have to copy things now, but we don't have to copy the entire thing. We have to find the path down to the node that we are interested in changing, and then we only copy the nodes along that path. So we have to make a new uh, root of the tree, but the right-hand side of that can be appointed to the, the, the old subtree. And we have to copy the two, but we don't have to copy the one, and then we get to the three, we make our changes after we copied it, and then we have a new tree, which is like more than half uh, the same as the previous tree. So that's um, basically, I think, that the general rule for, for persistent data structures, if they're going to be efficient at all, is try and make them into a tree. And um, after thinking about optimizing it and such, we get to something like a B tree, which is, um, this is basically the same as that binary tree, except it's, it's no longer binary. Uh, the B tree in, in my current implementation is, I think, up to 32 or 64 um, elements per level, per node. And that means that the log n to get down to, to a leaf becomes considerably shorter just because uh, there are going to be fewer nodes because you can fit more space into them. So it gets slightly more expensive to copy them, but you save so much on, on most operations that it doesn't really matter. And this is how ordered, lists, uh, ordered maps sorry, are done in, um, in the standard library. And uh, along with being persistent, I do it in exactly the same way. So let's talk about trees. And this is my, this is, this annoys me so much. Um, Lisbeth in the audience recognize one of these, I'm sure. John McCarthy is the fellow with the Unix beard. He invented Lisp. But we're not here to talk about John McCarthy today. We're here to talk about the guy to the right of him in the tan jacket. That is Edward Fredkin. Now, so there's this data structure which is called trees, T-R-I-E's. He did not invent it. That was some Frenchman two years earlier, whose name I cannot remember. But he coined the name for it. He was a colleague of, of the inventor of, of, of trees. But they couldn't come up with a good name, so he thought, well, um, basically we're using this structure for retrieval, so let's shorten retrieval down to tree. And the thing is, a tree, T-R-I-E, tree, is a prefix or relic based search tree, which means a tree is a specialized form of a tree, which is not confusing at all. He decided, yes, you have to pronounce it tree, um, because obviously, and yeah, naming is hard. It's like the, the guy who invented GIFs, who decided they were supposed to be pronounced GIF, which is ridiculous. Oh, and, and that reminds me, uh, it's pronounced sad. <laughs> anyway, so this is all ridiculous to me. So I'm just going to call them radix trees from now on to avoid any kind of confusion. Um, this is sort of the idea behind them, that um, you sort of split up the key into its, its uh, subcomponents and, and use that as a search path through the actual uh, search tree. This is a, a diagram I, I just got off Wikipedia that seems to explain it uh, succinctly. <laughs> Basically, uh, we're using strings here as keys to look up values. So if you want to look up uh, TED, you'll see the number four attached to the TED there. Basically, you, you split up the word TED into its into its component letters. And you start with the T, we got a connection for the T there, we go down to the E, and we get down to the D there, and we made TED, and that's four. Which is pretty clever. But then there's this guy uh, called Phil Bagwell, 
And now we're at about the mid-2000s. Um, he actually took this thing seriously and decided to make some very, very efficient data structures uh, based on the idea of radix trees. And so he came up with this thing. This is my implementation for hash map in the immutable library, incidentally. Um, so he's basically using the same trick as with the strings previously, but he's using the hash map and he's using some very clever bit, bit operations that I'm not going to try to explain to, to uh, make this tree cleverly sparse. But it's still basically the same idea. And it's still basically a tree. So um, it's still persistent and it's still really quite efficient. And then finally, this fellow called Rich Hickey, he made a language called Clojure. I think possibly the first lisp that is. Uh, the words first and rest instead of car and cutter, for which I will never forgive him. But uh, he took this uh, hash map and uh, kind of popularized it. I think Clojure was the first language where, where we started thinking of, of data structures that, as really essential to the language. He took uh, Bagwell's uh, hash map and he also carried the idea forward a little bit and made this thing called what he called the persistent vector which is, is very similar, but instead of the hash as the radix, uh, the, the search path, he just uses the, uh, the index. This is basically the same data structure as a vec, except a, a bit more clever. It works kind of the same way. So you get really fast index lookup at O log n. And because of the, the size of, of each node, that is a very high log. So is usually extremely fast. Um, and so we got a data structure that has very efficient lookup. It's got very efficient append or, or pop from the back as well. And with some trickery, um, which is a hack that, that Rich Hickey didn't actually use in Clojure, but which you will find in things like Immutable JS and in my implementation, you can also get efficient adds to the front. But one thing that's still going to be slow is concatenation. And so basically, this is annoying because there are data structures where you can get very efficient concatenation, but you won't get efficient index lookup for those. And now we got that vector, which has efficient indexing, and which um, is really slow at concatenation. So why can't we just have a data structure that's perfect? And so here's Phil Bagwell again. Basically, the, the last thing he gave us, he sadly passed away in 2012, um, was this thing called relaxed radix balance trees, which is a further development on, on, on Hickey's uh, vector but which allows a, a more relaxed structure to the tree. And I'm also not going to try and explain how that works, especially because I'm actually running out of time. Um, but it's a clever hack that involves uh, size tables when necessary, which means that um, how the tree looks is, is less important than in, uh, in the vector. So concatenation is something you can just do by basically joining two trees together with, with a new root. Sort of. I'm oversimplifying, but yeah. So this is not actually in my library yet, because I had to take time off to write this talk for, for, for one thing. Uh, but I'm really excited about the potential for this. Basically, it's, it's O log n across the board, and it should be really efficient. But why? Why, why do we even want to have these, these data structures? Why, why are they useful? Well, so the classic uh, argument, the, the Haskell defense, as I call it, is that immutable values make it easier to reason about your program. In fact, and this is, this is true, in fact, in Haskell, it makes it so easy to reason about your program that they had to introduce things like monad transformers and profunctor optics just to make it hard again. <laughs> uh, but the thing is, uh, so the idea is, is if values don't change, then it's a lot easier to, to track what's going on. But Rust has this too. So that's not really a good argument. I mean, Rust is actually able to, to track your, how your mutable data structures change in a way that sort of eliminates this argument, almost. And the same with thread safety. Because obviously, if a value never changes, you don't have to worry about somebody else changing it in a different thread. 
but Rust kind of manages this too. So uh, here's an, um, an argument that's actually still sort of valid. Uh, the idea of evolving state, like say if you have a recursive algorithm that needs a backtrack, if you're using recursive, uh, sorry, if you're using persistent data structures, you don't really need to worry about how to backtrack. It will just, yeah, you go back to the previous value that, that you happen to have still stored. Likewise, with stateful apps like uh, with uh, Redux or Elm, then um, the entire state can be stored in a persistent data structure, and you can just roll back to previous states or keep snapshots around or, or like have a slider that will get you through the entire state, the history of, of the application state, which is really cool if you're writing UIs. But I think the core argument is they are actually faster. This is a bold claim, probably. For one thing, cloning is always a constant time, because basically you're just copying um, a pointer and, and increasing a reference counter. But clone is maybe not the most exciting operation you can do. Uh, I want to touch upon VEC, which is actually a, a pretty cool little data structure for simplicity. I mean, it's got poor big O performance, but in the end, it's really, really fast if it's small. If it fits inside your CPU cache, it's completely unbeatable. It's ridiculous. Like, honestly, um, I ran benchmarks with, with const lists versus just literally cloning a vector every time I changed it. And the const list had to get up to like a couple of hundred elements before it's actually faster, which is ridiculous. But the thing is, with, with uh, chunking techniques, which I'm not going to explain, but I'm going to show you uh, the name of a paper about it if you're interested. Uh, is that we can, um, we can basically take these benefits from the efficiency of very small VEX and, and sort of borrow them for things like the RRB vector. Uh, what we come back to, though, every time is that mutable data structures are always going to be faster than immutable data structures. And Closure addresses this by, with, the, with the idea of uh, transients. And Haskell has the ST monad, similarly. I managed to get the M word in. I'm very proud of myself. Uh, which is basically the idea that uh, a persistent data structure can be mutable as long as nobody else sees it. So inside a function, uh, this allows you to, to mutate it as much as you want until you return it and somebody else actually sees it. Then it stops being mutable. But this is Rust, and it turns out we've got this amazing function called make mute inside um, the arc uh, reference counter thing, which, uh, because this is so low level that we're actually tracking reference counting ourselves. And so we know whether we're the, the sole owner of a data structure. So we can use this. This basically uh, looks at the reference count. And if it's at one, it just gives you a mutable reference. And if it's uh, more than that, it copies it first and gives you a mutable reference to that. So basically, I'm just implementing all my data structures as mutable. And this thing will just magically uh, make them immutable for me without having to do any work at all, almost. I had to put this bit in here. Sorry. Uh, so basically, we have mutable data structures with immutable guarantees, and they perform like it. And so I'm going to have to pick up some pace here because I just ran out of time. Um, so RB vectors do complex things in a smarter way than VEC. And with chunking, we can get similar performance out of our RB vectors as with VEC, ideally. Um, and at small sizes, uh, because then it's just the, the chunking head or the tail, uh, it literally kind of is just a VEC or two VECs at worst. The memory footprint is only slightly worse than VEC, but VEC will always be better. And likewise, with maps, the implementation is pretty similar to the mutable bits. It's just with an added make mute. Um, if I've done my job right anyway, and I'm still working on it, but we'll get that, I hope. Still with a slightly worse memory footprint, but hey, that's the price to pay. Uh, I'm going to skip over this bit, because I did run out of time. I want to point out this thing, though. This is my guiding principle when writing this library that nobody's going to use a library with, with bad documentation. Uh, so I spent, <laughs> I spent as much time as I, I can actually writing uh, documentation for this thing, trying to explain my thinking. 
Uh, this, I will also skip. And so thank you very much. Don't, don't applaud yet. I want to, first of all, I want to draw attention to my heroes, Belka and Strelka, famous cosmonauts. And this is the bit that you should be applauding, not Belka and Strelka, but my sources. Thank you very much. <laughs>